phenomenology workshop. So uh, the first speaker is uh, Marcello uh, Sconzi. Please uh, start. Okay. Uh, so thank you, the organizers, for the invitation. Thank you, the audience, for being here. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to tell you about uh, a series of results that have been obtained with uh, different people who are Fabio Benfica, James Grabber, Wu Huang, George Noronha, Maria Rados, Casey Rodriguez, and Yan Zhen Shao. Uh, when Masuda invited me to, to give this talk, he said that one of the goals, not the only one, but one of the goals of this workshop was to bring students up to speed in some of the most recent developments in the field. Uh, so because of that, I'm going to try to make my talk uh, more or less self-contained, uh, and it's going to be a bit more on the basic side, because I want to make sure that students uh, understand uh, what I'm going to say. So uh, uh, I guess this slide is probably uh, known to everyone. So I'm going to use this slide more to fix my notation convention. A relativistic ideal fluid is described by the relativistic Euler equations it's written here. Uh, so curly T is the energy momentum tensor and J is the baryon current. And my notation is as follows. Rho is the energy density and is the baryon density, P is the pressure given by an equation of state. U is the fluid velocity or four velocity, if you want to be more precise, uh, which satisfies the usual normalization condition, it has to be a time-like unit vector field. G is the space-time metric and NABLA the corresponding covariant derivative. And as it is known, the relativistic Euler equations are widely used in the study of many physical systems. Uh, however, there are important situations where we need a theory of relativistic viscous fluids. One such situation uh, is, of course, the quark gluon plasma, uh, which has been extensively discussed in this workshop. So I just want to maybe point out to another important situation uh, where this cause is likely to be important, and that's related to the title of my talk which is the study of neutron star mergers. So it is known uh, the equation of state for neutron stars uh, remains uncertain, uh, except in certain limits. But for a long time, it was thought that you could model the system using the Einstein-Euler equations. That's because it was thought that the time scales for viscous transport set in uh, were outside the 10 millisecond range, which they scale typically associated uh, with damping due to gravitational wave emission. So that's what was thought for many years. Uh, however, these estimates, the old estimates, they have been recently revised by Alfred, Bovard, Honosky, Rizzola, and Schwenzer. <clears throat> and their results can be interpreted as follows. So what they did, uh, they ran some state-of-the-art numerical simulations of general relativistic ideal fluids. And with that, they can get an estimate for the characteristic microscopic scale that is associated with the gradients of the fluid variables. <clears throat> uh, and then they use some uh, microscopic theory arguments uh, to get an estimate for the characteristic microscopic scale of the system. And once they have these two estimates, then they can go ahead and get an estimate for the Knudsen number. And th their main conclusion is that the Knudsen number may not be small in some cases. And then, as you know, if the Knudsen number is not small, then viscosity is going to be important. So this is telling us that viscous contributions are likely to affect the gravitational wave signal. So this is another example of a system, uh, these neutron star mergers, where uh, you want to go beyond the ideal uh, model and you want to include viscosity uh, for your description. Uh, notice that I'm talking about uh, gravitational waves. So here we are in the uh, realm of general relativistic fluids, which is the title of my talk. So everything I'm going to say is aiming at, at uh, description of fluids when you include coupling to Einstein's equations. 
Okay, so then uh, now if you need to include the viscosity, how, how can we model that? The starting point uh, for relativistic risk fluid is the same starting point for the ideal fluid is the energy momentum tensor. So the quantities here, rho, u, and p are the same as before. Uh, capital pi is just my notation for the projection that uh, usually people denote by delta. And I'm introducing here some new quantities, which are the viscous fluxes, uh, curly r, curly p, curly q, and pi. And these are the viscous correction to the density appearing here, the viscous correction to the pressure here, the heat flow, and the viscous shear stress. So those are the viscous fluxes. Uh, P, as before, is given by an equation of state, the equilibrium pressure. Uh, but for most of the talk, uh, I'm going to ignore the barium density. So I'm not going to have a barium current, just for simplicity, because I want to keep uh, everything I'm going to present uh, very simple. <clears throat> uh, now, so, to the, so this is just a, a general expression to actually define a theory of relativistic viscous fluids, what we need to do, we need to specify what these viscous fluxes are. Uh, the viscous fluxes, what they are doing, they are, uh, you can see them as a parameterization of the out of equilibrium hydrodynamic variables. And each choice of how we make this parameterization is sometimes referred in the literature as a hydrodynamic frame. Now, as you can imagine, there are infinitely many choices you can make. Uh, of course, not all of them uh, are going to be good, but there, in principle, there are infinitely many choices. But in general, in the literature, people uh, have focused on two classes of choices for, um, for how to define the viscous fluxes. The first type of choice leads to what are known as first order theories. Uh, in these theories, uh, the viscous fluxes, they are some known expressions. They are given in terms of the density, the velocity, and their derivatives. So your equation of motion in this first order theory is they're going to be the divergence of the energy momentum tensor equal to zero, uh, possibly coupling to Einstein equations. And the underlying philosophy here is that of a great expansion. So somehow uh, you want to think that the energy momentum tensor is arising uh, by some expansion in our truncated this expansion, uh, in this case, at first order. That's what they're called first order theories. Although, of course, you can go to higher orders. Another choice that's done uh, in, in the literature uh, leads to what are known as second order theories. And the basic philosophy now is that you treat the viscous fluxes not as something given in terms of the hydrodynamic variables, but you treat them as new variables, which are to be considered on the same footing as the density and the velocity. So your equation of motions now, they're going to be as before, the divergence of the energy momentum tensor equal to zero, possibly coupling to Einstein equations. But what you have to do, you have to supplement uh, the system by further equations which are going to be satisfied by the viscous fluxes. And just from accounting principle makes sense, you're introducing new variables in your uh, system should introduce new equations of motion to end up with a closed system. And the underlying philosophy here is that of the method of moments. So in a nutshell, uh, in first order theories, if you have a viscous flux, for example, uh, like the shear stress, that's a known expression in the density velocity and its derivatives. And in a second order theory, a viscous flux, again, as a, for example, the shear stress, it's going to satisfy its own equation of motion. So those are the two basic philosophies that people have used. Although perhaps I, I should say that uh, my talk is already outdated because we just learned uh, last week in the talk by Michael that uh, um, him, uh, Georgie, and uh, Enrico they introduced this new theory that in one limit reduces to Rao Stewart and the other limit reduces to BDNK. So that would be a mix of these two philosophies. But I'm not going to talk about that today. So let me give examples. Uh, this, again, uh, as I said, I'm going to uh, be very basic. So pro probably everyone have seen this, but uh, let me uh, make sure that everybody is on the same page. The first example of viscous theories, they, uh, they go back to Eckert and Dow Lifshitz in the 40s and 50s. These are first order theories. 
which are defined as follows. Uh, we set the viscous correction to the energy density to be equal to zero. And we define the shear, uh, the viscous shear and the viscous correction of the pressure by these complicated expressions. I, I can also write down what the heat flux uh, would be. I'm just going to ignore for in this slide for simplicity. Okay. They're going to, they're given by this uh, complicated expressions. I just want to point out that once it appears here in these expressions, you have these coefficients eight and zeta. They are some known functions of the density, uh, which are the coefficients of shear and bulk viscosity. Now, uh, if you have never seen this, this looks a little arbitrary. So how did Ecker and Dalif arrive at this specific choice? Uh, in essence, they were uh, seeking for a covariant generalization of the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, and then uh, they were uh, making sure to enforce that the entropy production is non-negative. And with those choices and some other choices that, uh, that they have, uh, you arrive at these expressions in a more or less natural way. Now, this, uh, if you, when you see this for the first time, uh, at least for me, when I saw this for the first time, of course, many years ago, uh, it looks very natural. Uh, but then turns out that these theories do not work. What I, do I mean by do not work? They have some pathologies. Uh, they, first, they violate causality. So these theories, they lead to faster than light signals, the Eckert, landau lifshitz theories. Uh, mathematically, what is happening here is the equations of motion turn out not to be hyperbolic. Okay, so the structure of the equations is not a hyperbolic uh, uh, structure for the partial differential equations. Uh, these theories, they also are unstable. And by stability here, uh, uh, we mean this one of the simplest types of stability, which is mold stability. Of course, there is always the question of whether uh, uh, that's the correct notion of stability to look at. And I think we are going to probably learn more about this uh, in the next talk by Lorenzo, who's going to tell us about stability. Now, what I want to point out is that this is not only a, 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 a feature, uh, a bad feature of Landau and landau lifshitz and Eckert's theories, these instability and causality results, they apply to a large class of first order theories. And the message here is that it turns out to be difficult to construct causal and stable theories of relativistic fluids with viscosity. And a great deal of work uh, has been done trying to address this issue. Okay, so let's move on <clears throat> and let me uh, now talk about the Israeli Stewart theory. Uh, again, the starting point is the energy momentum tensor. Uh, so this is a second order theory introduced back in the 70s by Israeli Stewart, uh, uh, basically following uh, some work on classical fluids done by Miller. Uh, although what people mean by Israel Stewart uh, nowadays are the modern versions that have been derived by these different groups of authors. In strictly speaking, all these theories are different. The equation of motion is slightly different in all the cases, but they are very similar in uh, the basic philosophy. So uh, we usually refer collectively to all these theories as Israel Stewart theories. <clears throat> So this theory is defined as follows. Uh, we set uh, the viscous correction to the density to be zero. And then the equations of motion are, as usual, the divergence of the energy moment tensor equal to zero. You can couple to Einstein equations. But because it's a second order theory, as I mentioned, we have to postulate further equations of motion that satisfied, are satisfied by these viscous fluxes. So the equations are written uh, in a more symbolic, more or less symbolic form here. Uh, we don't have to pay attention right now too much for the details of these equations. I just want to point out that when you write these equations, you always have some coefficients here uh, that are relaxation times. So essentially, these are relaxation type equations. <clears throat> uh, and then there are further terms here. Uh, on the right hand side, I'm not writing exactly what they are, but uh, they can in principle involve derivatives of all your fields. And, and that depends exactly you know, which terms you're including or not. And from a mathematical point of view, uh, what these equations are telling you is that from the point of view of the theory of partial differential equations, these are top order terms. What do I mean by top order terms? Uh, well, I mean that these 
equations are complicated. That's what I mean. I mean that this, this, the israel stewart equations turn out to be a highly complex system. It's a large system with non-diagonal principal part. So these equations are kind of you know, very difficult to analyze mathematically. <clears throat> now, let me just give a quick summary of uh, what we know about israel stewart We know a lot of good things about this theory. <clears throat> First, the stability holds. So that's a good thing. If you look at the linearization about the global equilibrium, then uh, this, the, the, these linearized equations are causal. By uh, linearization about the global equilibrium, I mean that you linearize the equations about the states where the density, the velocity, the density velocity are constant and all the viscous fluxes vanish. <clears throat> uh, causality has been established in some uh, particular cases in one plus one dimension and also in rotational symmetry. Uh, and last, but of course not the least, this theory uh, has been very successful in applications to the, to the study of the quark gluon plasma. So, the, so this theory has been very successful in applications. So when you combine all these features, what is telling is that Israel Stewart is a very good theory for many applications that uh, we are interested in. <clears throat> However, uh, there are some important questions that remained uh, open. The first is the question of local well poseness. And for this, I simply mean the question of existence and uniqueness of solutions to the initial value problem. Right? The initial value problem is that you give initial conditions and you want to guarantee that there exists a unique solution uh, to the equation of motion that arises from those initial conditions. Right? <clears throat> and the other question is the question of causality in three plus one dimension. Right? So there we had these previous results in symmetry. Uh, or in lower dimensions, but if you, the, the, the real physics is happening in three plus one dimensions without symmetry assumption. And then I remind you that the only causality that had been proven before was for the linearized equations when you linearize about this specific state where the viscous fluxes vanish. So addressing these two questions is what I'm gonna tell you about in the next slide. So that's our first result, <clears throat> which says the following. Uh, the israel Stewart equations, they are causal. The Cauchy problem, and by Cauchy problem, that's simply another word for the initial value problem. So the Cauchy problem is locally well posed in Gevray spaces. Uh, and in the particular case where you don't have uh, the heat flux or the shear viscosity, then local well posedness holds in Sobolev spaces. And I'm, I'm going to tell you in a second what these Gevray and Sobolev spaces are. Uh, now, most important for, you know, according to the title of my talk, these results hold with, but also without, coupling twice and equations. So even if we couple twice and equations, we can prove the equations are causal, uh, and given initial conditions, there exists a unique solution uh, that arises from those initial conditions uh, in these function spaces. Uh, now, let me tell you about what these spaces are. So the basic idea, I'm not going to give you a technical definition, but the basic idea is the following. Whenever you are studying a system, uh, you know, look at its mathematical properties, you're always uh, looking for solutions within a certain function space, within a certain class of functions. The canonical example that everybody knows is that if you're doing quantum mechanics, you don't look at all possible uh, wave functions. You will look only at the class of wave functions that are square integrable. Right, so there are some class of functions to look at. Uh, and in partial differential equations, there are two classes of functions called Gevray and Sobolev that are very used in the study of problems like uh, initial value problem. But uh, the message I want to get across here is the following. So if you're interested in general relativistic simulations, which is what you need for numeric simulations of neutron star, uh, typically, you want equations of motion that are local well posed in Sobolev spaces. Those are the good spaces do, for numerical simulations. Gevray spaces turn out to be bad for numerical simulations. So uh, a local well posed in Gevray spaces is too restrictive if you want to go ahead and carry out numerical simulations and, and guarantee that your schemes are going to converge and those kind of things. OK, so that's our first, first result. Uh, I'm not going to tell you about the proof. I just have some bullet points here that I can come back later if people have questions about uh, ideas of the proof. But in general, I just want to give the statements and skip the proofs. Now, of course, 
as you can imagine, uh, our theorem, like any theorem, holds under certain assumptions. I just gave sort of the informal version of the theorem. But some of the assumptions that we have in the theorem is that they, uh, uh, the, the hypothesis that we need certain inequalities among certain scalar quantities of the problem. So the statement is that if certain inequality holds, then the system is causal, local opposed, and so on. And the inequalities, there are several of them. Uh, they take forms like this. Uh, you don't have to pay too much attention about what uh, all the terms here mean. You just need to know for the sake of this talk that there are certain inequalities that need to be satisfied for the conclusion uh, to follow. Uh, but perhaps more interestingly, uh, we also derive some necessary conditions for causality. So there is another set of inequalities. Again, the details are not very important right now, but it's another set of inequalities that are necessary conditions for causality. What do I mean by that? So if these inequalities are violated, then necessarily the system is not causal. Now, these are kind of good inequalities for applications because what you can do, you can go ahead now, you can go back to your numerical simulations and you can simply test at each time step whether or not those inequalities hold. And if they do not hold, if they're violated, then you're simulating a system that's not causal. And this has been done recently by two different groups of authors. Uh, I'm gonna report here quickly on the work of uh, Plummer and collaborators. So what they did, they did, they went back to some of the standard numerical simulations of the quark gluon plasma and test this inequality. And what they found is that up to 30% of the initial fluid cells violate causality, okay? So as you can imagine, uh, so we are running all these numerical simulations, but you are actually running uh, outside the causal regime. Uh, I guess that uh, raises many follow-up interesting questions about what exactly we can conclude from these numerical simulations. But I'm not gonna discuss that. I'm just pointing out the result. You can, uh, you know, I refer you to the work of Plummer and collaborators for more details. But that's just a, an example of how we can use this theorem uh, in some uh, concrete uh, application. You can go back to your numerical simulations and now test if causality holds. Okay, as I was saying, uh, Israel Stewart is a very good theory for applications, but I wanna maybe uh, just raise some potential limitations of Israel Stewart. One is that it is not known whether this is applicable to the study of viscous effects on nutrient star mergers. By not applicable, I mean that first, we actually don't know if that's the correct theory, um, but on a more practical level, we don't have a local opposedness in subordinate spaces. So uh, that, that might be a, a, a drawback when you wanna run this full general relativistic numerical simulations and guarantee that the schemes are stable, convergent and so on. <clears throat> Also, it is not known whether uh, Israel Stewart is applicable to low energy heavy ion collisions when vorticity effects and dynamics of the baryon current are relevant. Uh, in a certain sense, this is more an aesthetic aspect, but uh, you, you have all these different equations that I call Israel Stewart, but these are actually different theories, right? So it doesn't look like a very universal uh, thing. Uh, and of course, as I just tell you, uh, I was just, as I was just telling you, we, there is this question of causality in, in the actual simulations that might uh, require some reassessment of uh, some of the conclusions in these simulations in light of these new causality conditions that we have found. And finally, uh, there are difficulties in Israel Stewart to describe shocks. So when you put all this together, I think it's fair to say that there is enough motivation uh, for alternative theories. So I'm gonna go ahead and tell you about one alternative theory that uh, is the BDNK theory. So this is now a first order theory, which is the combination of several works by different authors. And as I said, the first order theory. So let me define this theory for you. Uh, again, the starting point is the energy momentum tensor written here. <clears throat> And now the viscous fluxes are given by these horrible expressions, okay? And uh, again, the details are not very important right now. <clears throat> so uh, don't, don't, don't get scared by just looking at these uh, monstros monstrosities that I'm writing here. Uh, wha what I wanna point out that even though this looks complicated, that's something that we actually need for uh, this theory. 
So all these several thirds that we are considering uh, in all these viscous fluxes, uh, they turn out to be needed if you want to fix the causality and instability problems of the Ackerman and landau lifshitz theories. Just as an example, let's go back to uh, Ackerman and landau lifshitz Let's look at the viscous correction to the pressure in these theories. Uh, is only at the divergence, not, turns out to be the only divergence of the velocity with the coefficient of viscosity there. And in BDNK, of course, you have the same term, but then you have a bunch of other terms that appear. And you need all those extra terms if you want to uh, construct a theory that's going to be causal and stable. Uh, and of course, as I was just saying, uh, this theory turns out to be causal and stable. So that's our next result. The BDN equations are causal and stable, and the Cauchy problem, which means the initial value problem, is locally well posed in Sobolev spaces, in these good function spaces uh, that I was telling you about. And again, what I emphasize is that these results hold with, but also without, coupling to Einstein equations. So this is fully general relativistic theory. And let me uh, also mention that uh, even though I'm not discuss discussing the baryon current here for simplicity, this theorem actually holds if we include a baryon current. And once more, <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you about the proof, but I can come back and make some comments in the proof if you're interested in knowing more uh, of the technical details. Now, if you haven't seen this, of course, the question that everybody is asking is that where do all those terms come from? How, how, how did they do, how do people arrive at the BDNK tensor? Uh, and so I mean, let me give sort of a summary of how we can arrive at this, this theory. The starting point, of course, is the energy momentum tensor. But the underlying idea is that of an effective theory, which means we start with the most general energy momentum tensor, which is compatible with the symmetries. Okay, so you write your energy momentum tensor, and right now all I'm writing is a tensor identity. I'm writing the energy momentum tensor in terms of its irreducible components. <clears throat> okay, so for example, this component here is simply double contraction with u, this is contraction with u, and uh, the, the orthogonal, and so on. So these are irreducible components. And then, of course, you want your theory to reduce the ideal case. So then you know that this coefficient here, for example, has to be the density plus some viscous correction. This coefficient is going to be the equilibrium pressure plus some viscous correction, and so on. Right? So you write, you set things in, up in a way that if you don't have these viscous corrections, you get back the Euler or the ideal energy momentum tensor. <clears throat> Then you impose that your viscous corrections are going to involve only to up to first order derivatives of the hydrodynamic variables and are going to, in fact, be linear on the derivative. So you don't have, for example, derivative squared. <clears throat> so, for example, then this coefficient r has to be something like this, involve the derivative of is a scalar, so it has to be either derivative on the direction of the, uh, of the, the derivative of the density in the direction of u or the divergence of u with appropriate coefficients. And then uh, the physics tells that some of these coefficients have to be related. For example, if you want, uh, ent if you want the, the entropy to be maximized the equilibrium, then certain coefficients have to be proportional. There are some arguments like that that come from physics. And then uh, <clears throat> once you have things that are proportional, uh, a, a dimensional analysis tells you what the proportionality has to be. So we have a p plus rho here appearing and so on. So all this is very natural. And then finally, what you do, you have to find relations among the transport coefficients and the scalars of your problem that ensure causality, stability, and so on. And of course, finding such relations, which is going to give rise to the inequalities that I was mentioning, that's where the hard and technical work is. Right? But that's the content of the theorem. <clears throat> So uh, in a sense, I just want to maybe uh, summarize this slide, tell you what the underlying philosophy is. Uh, I think the point of view is that you should let the fundamental principle of causality constrain which terms are allowed in the theory, not the other way around. Instead of starting with uh, energy momentum tensor and start making choices of frames and so on, and then only after ask about causality, you should think that causality is the fundamental principle. Therefore, causality is what should guide you and tell you which is terms are allowed and which terms are not allowed in our theory. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now, this is all very nice, but you might say, okay, but is that related to physics? Because if it's not related to physics, right? If you cannot, 
cannot connect BDNK theory with non physics, then that might be a very interesting theory mathematically, but it's not, it's not very useful for physicists, right? So to connect to physics first, what one can show is that the entropy production is non-negative within the limit of validity of the theory. By limit of validity, I mean that uh, there is some power counting that comes into place, which tells which terms you- Five can. minutes. Thank you. Which terms you can and which terms you cannot neglect. Uh, this tensor is derivable uh, from a kinetic theory, at least formally, in some specific limits, for example, in the case of barotropic theory. <clears throat> uh, we, we can uh, run some test cases in conformal fluids, in the case of the Bjork and Gunther flow, which where, where the behavior of the system is, is known. Or, so in the BDNK theory reproduces the expected behavior in these test cases. <clears throat> now, these are just test cases. You can go uh, beyond that. And you can actually do full numerical simulations of the BDNK theory. Uh, and that has been done recently by uh, Pandya and Pretorius. Okay, so it's not like full three plus one general. I think it's one plus one in the conformal case, but it's, it's something already beyond Bjork and Gubser. So Pandya and Pretorius did that. And they also compare the results with simulation of the Israeli steward. And what they find is that BDNK and Israeli steward pretty much agree, give more or less the same thing, at least for small viscosity. And so if you, if you accept, as we all do, that Israeli steward is connected with uh, actual physics and describing many physical systems, then for small viscosity, BDNK is giving you the same results. So that's telling kind of BDNK is also describing some known physics. Uh, another thing that uh, Pend and Pretorius found, which is very interesting, they found that BDNK has some smoothing effects, which I'm not going to have time to discuss, but I can go back during Q&A if people want to know a little more about it, why I think it's very interesting they found this. So in sum, uh, the BDNK theory has many of the good features of Israel Stewart, plus a good local opposedness in sobolev spaces, which currently is lacking for Israel Stewart, at least uh, in the general case. We have local opposing sobolev spaces for Israel Stewart only when Q and Pi are absent. And as I was saying, right, uh, this is something desirable if you wanna study nuclear star mergers because you wanna run fully, numer fully general relativistic numerical simulations. Okay, uh, I'm almost uh, at the end. Uh, one last thing I want to point out is that typically when you talk about fluid dynamics, one issue that always uh, pops up is the issue of shocks and singularities. Uh, for Israel Stewart, as I mentioned before, uh, there are no, it's known that there are no physically acceptable strong viscous shock profile solutions. And we cannot uh, formulate a weak solution of Israel Stewart because the equations are not in divergence form. <clears throat> For the BDNK, uh, the very first investigation of viscous shocks was done quite recently by Fry Stuller and Pende Pretorius. And what they find, although this is very preliminary, is that maybe there are, it seems that there are some potential advantages of BDNK over Israel Stewart uh, when it comes to the study of shocks. However, that's not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I want to address a different question related to shocks and singularity, which is the following. Can singularities form in finite time from smooth initial data in Israel Stewart and BDNK? Which means, suppose you start with initial data that is very nice, and then you solve your equations. Is it possible that after some finite time, a singularity forms? So it's like, even though if you start with very nice initial data, can you still form singularities okay, after some finite time? Uh, and the answer is yes. So for this, for Israel Stewart, for BDNK, we don't know yet, <clears throat> but that's the content of our next theorem, uh, which says that there exists an open set of smooth initial data for the Israel Stewart equations for which the corresponding unique smooth solutions to the Cauchy problem break down in finite time. So I talk about unique smooth solutions. Uh, so we are here dealing with the case of Israel Stewart where only bulk viscosity is present. So in that case, we can show that uh, given smooth initial data, there exist unique uh, smooth solutions to the Cauchy problem. But these unique smooth solutions uh, 
some of them, thanks to the data that we constructed, they have the property that the solution becomes singular after some finite time. Now you might ask uh, what is special about this initial data? They are essentially some uh, localized perturbation of constant states. So they are initial data, they are more or less constant everywhere. Uh, but then in some localized region, there is some large perturbation. So these solutions, they have large gradients. Uh, and as I said, um, I'm not going to discuss the proofs, but I can come back to some of the details later if people want to hear about. So uh, summing up, uh, I think uh, it's a very exciting time for the study of relativistic fluids. Uh, well, it has been for the last 20 years or so, but even more now, uh, where we expect that uh, viscous effects can be relevant for multi star mergers, and LIGO is going to be giving us lots of data in the next few years. Uh, in particular, uh, I think this is an excellent field for those interested in collaborative research among mathematicians and physicists. So if you like uh, the research at the intersection of math and physics, this is one of the hot fields to be working on. Because you see, on one hand, you have these theorems that are actually relevant for physics. Like, for example, we have this theorem saying that causality, you have to satisfy certain inequalities, and you can go back to your numerical codes, and you can actually uh, test that. On the other hand, uh, you cannot prove these theorems if you don't have the correct physical uh, inputs, the correct physical intuition. So, that, so the, it was very important when you were doing this to, to have physicists and mathematicians talking to each other to try to fine tune which hypotheses are relevant for the physicist, but are also relevant for the kind of techniques the mathematicians use. So uh, I guess I'm stopping here. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Marcello, for this uh, interesting talk. Now is time for uh, questions. So, um, Ulrich, please go ahead. Marcello, thank you very much for this beautiful talk and for, for making it so accessible for physicists. Um, your stability analysis are, of course, of very high interest to people like me who are applying these equations in practical contexts and just plow blindly ahead sometimes. So when you pointed to this um, work by Blumberg and collaborators, um, the, the, the statement that you, that you made, if correct me if I'm wrong, is that while Israel Stewart has some basic stability properties, when you, when you actually look at the practical implications, the choice of parameters is outside the the region where you uh, that you require for the stability to, for, for 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 your proof of stability, right? Uh, well, first of all, here it's not stability; it's causality, right? Uh, causality, yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yes. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. It's uh, it's it's outside. And again, the, you, there are these two sets of inequalities. One of them is that you know if the inequality is satisfied, then it's cause. Mm -hmm. so what what they test is these others are the necessary, which means that you know. Once these inequalities are violated, then you know for sure it's not caused. Right. And that's where about so. So my my, my question is the following. I mean, we all know that these all of these uh, uh, hydrodynamic approaches, at some point they break down, and we 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 like them because they are macroscopic, which means they are computationally easier than the microscopic kinetic description, and so we push them to the very edge of the of the limits of their application. Ability. So I see these plots, I see 30% of the initial fluid cells violate causality, but then I also see that with the within a very small fraction of a Fermi over C, that number goes down and basically disappears. So how, so, and, and we, we do things like regulating uh, when we see problems arising in the code, and then uh, we, 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 um, we see that the regulation is necessarily particularly at very early times, but then very, very quickly, the need for regulation goes away. So how much can have gone wrong in that fraction of a Fermi over C where I was operating the theory outside of its reach of validity? What, you can, what can you say as a mathematician about that? Okay, so uh, from a pure mathematical point of view, what can be what, what, what can happen is that uh, the theory is evolving perfectly. The equations have no problem, no singularity, nothing. It's just that you know the evolution is happening outside some causal regime. It's like 
you know, if you just take the wave equation and you put the coefficient c squared to be above one, you still have a perfectly nice wave equation. You can write explicitly what the solutions are. It's just, you know, physically is not, is outside causality, right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this probably is more a question for Plumberg and his collaborators, but as I understood what they are doing is that, as you're saying, there is this regulator, right? Mm -hmm. And it happens that this regulator brings uh, the system back to, co to, the, to the causal region, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the... The thing you have to be careful with that, at least from my point of view, that if that's the case, the theory you're simulating is not originally Israel story. It's a different theory, right? That is exactly that is exactly right. Yeah. So you're doing exactly. for for a while. You're not doing what you want to do, but because of exactly. technical problems. Yeah. Exactly. And then when you go back and you try to combine the result of the simulations with uh, an analysis of the original equations, you're sort of mixing things, right? Because mm -hmm. you really simulate at least part of your evolution simulating a different theory, right? Uh, now uh, I understand that as a matter of principle, that's bad. But as a matter of practice, how bad is it? <laughs> that I cannot tell you. Okay. <laughs> that okay. I cannot tell you. But uh, I, I think that, I think what this shows is at least that we should maybe uh, try to answer that question now, right? how bad that is, right? And uh, uh, I have some thoughts of how we can try to maybe make a quantitative assessment of how bad that is. Is, but that's something that I'm just starting to think about. Maybe I can next time we meet, I can report on something more concrete to you. Very good, thank you. Okay, uh, George. Um, sorry, it's just a, a point coming back to Uli's. Um, so one thing that is interesting actually is that unless you go to a smaller system, like a kind of small system, the regulator doesn't show up that much actually. Um, so all this uh, a-causality stuff is appearing, but the regulator doesn't act too much unless you go to a very extreme thing like a PP and very crazy stuff. So um, I don't. So the point is the numerical part is actually pretty good. Um, so it's really the causality is a physical. The violation of causality is a physical thing. So the code did what it was supposed to. That's my point. Thank you. It just didn't know that it was a cause. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question, uh, Misha. So uh, I want to make a point, point to the question which uh, Uli asked and was discussed uh, right now, is that one way to look at the violation of causality is it's a red flag which um, the um, system throws, which tells us that hydrodynamics doesn't apply in this region. Uh, right, because there is a region of applicability of hydrodynamics and uh, uh, because that requires hydrodynamic expansion to work. Um, so uh, uh, this causal violation of this equation is just one way to tell you that uh, uh, you, you are in that region. Right? I but, but so, this is to tell us how, how fully used these inequalities, right? Because uh, even if that's all there is, it's simply telling tell that you are running outside the limit of validity of the hydrodynamic approximation, it's good yeah, to know course. that, right? It's good so to know that. Uh, but if you take this point of view, then it would also tell you that there is no hydrodynamic description in this regime. Right. So trying to improve hydrodynamics in this regime uh, would not produce a description which is as systematic. I mean, it certainly will uh, allow you to produce a description which at least satisfies the basic physics of actually is systematically close to the uh, solving the quantum field theoretical problem in that regime, because that regime is outside of the validity of any hydrodynamic description. That's what I'm trying to Right. Yeah. No. There's a description in terms of finite number of fields. I, I agree, but let me just add that we have to be a little, little more. Little, we have to be a little careful what what we mean by the hydrodynamic description. My, it might be that there is a hydrodynamic description that is applicable to that regime, but maybe we have to go to higher order, right, in our expansion or something like that. So possibly, but more likely is that you have to go to infinite order. Yeah, then, then it's not, no longer hydrodynamics, right? Right. Uh, so in other words, imagine that you do Taylor expansion and obviously 
uh, you want the next uh, term to be smaller than the previous one. But when the next term, when this is not true, just going to the next order usually is not enough. Usually it means that uh, uh, you have to do something better than Taylor expansion. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, no, so I, I, that's, uh, I, I there is some partially, and that is probably what uh, 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 the way that I would understand. And some resummation would be more, um, more um, uh, sort of faithfully approximating the uh, the actual uh, system itself. But it's not as as systematic as hydrodynamic expansion or as Taylor expansion is. Right. Right. Yeah. But again, it goes back to what I was saying. So uh, even if in the end the conclusion here is okay, that, that you are, you're not only outside in this approximation, but on any approximation, once you have like this concrete inequalities, right? That tell you that, that no, helps you I, to map. Uh, yeah, these I'm inequalities are extremely useful. I agree completely. Um, I just uh, want, want to make sure that we don't jump to the. Right, right. No, I'm, I'm not making any. any I, I'm, I'm not telling you, no. Okay, it's not causal, so forget about it. We have to interpret what this means, right? And uh, and again, this is not even my work. I'm just sitting, citing plumbers. And, and, and then my uh, question is more of a curiosity. So uh, there is a, uh, this statement which you made uh, about Israel Stewart, um, about this, the singularity in a finite time, is very uh, recent of one of the clay millennium problems. Uh, yeah, about, exactly. Uh, the Navier Stokes equation. As I remember, it has been proven uh, that navier stokes equation doesn't develop such a singularity. So is it the same statement about Israel Stewart uh, that- Yeah, it is the kind of similar statement, right? So for the millennium problem, the millennium problem is for specifically for the incompressible navier stokes, right? And of course, we don't know. And if I could prove for the navier stokes, probably I would be give my talk from the beach in Maui, right? But isn't uh, it, has, hasn't been proved by some Russian guy recently? Uh, Iraq price for that, or is it no? No, no, no. Um, Did I misunderstand so, what was proven? No, I said, no the, the millennium problem remains open. Uh, what has, I don't know if we're talking about the same Russian person, but what has been proved recently is some sing, formation of singularity for compressible Navier Stokes. That's what I asked. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that's not the millennium problem. Yes. I see. Okay, thank you for clarifying this. Yes. No problem. Yeah. Thanks. So we have time for uh, only one other question, Yuri, very quickly. Um, okay, I'll try to be quick. So um, basically there was a statement here that based on the references, it, it seems that the state of the art hydro simulations are kind of okay in terms of causality. But basically I'm wondering, so there was, there was this work by, by Byers and, and Liam and McGinn and Jimmy Nagel, which was actually examining different things, the, the, the so-called um, cavitation problem, when, when basically the bulk pressure becomes so, so large and negative, that it kind of overturns the um, equilibrium pressure. And they actually found that this thing happens in not really negligible number of cells. Mm -hmm. So could you actually comment, I mean, this, this cavitation thing where does it lie with respect to the causality and stability of the of the hydro? Okay, uh, I can't speak, talk specifically about this result you are mentioning because I'm not aware of the paper. So I'll be glad if you could send the reference later. What I can tell you is that uh, you can go back to the inequalities and it, you know we can look at our paper and where are inequalities now? Uh, yeah. And you can actually go to the inequalities and see if, uh, for example, like you have something like this. So here, uh, so here, the lambda is uh, one of the eigenvalues of the shear, uh, shear tensor, right? Uh, the, the viscous shear. So you can actually look uh, if you can violate some of the inequalities by just taking like P plus uh, the viscous pressure, right? That's what I think the cavitation are saying, like when the, that combination becomes negative or something like that, right? So you can actually look at the the inequalities, for example, the necessary conditions, for example, and see if that becomes very negative, if you can that, uh, if can, can that uh, violate on one of the inequalities. But uh, I would have to look at the inequalities more carefully and see what is happening in each one of them. I, I cannot give an answer on top of my head, but I think it's, my, my initial answer that's probably related, right? Because of this, you can probably maybe violate some of these inequalities. <clears throat> 
Okay, uh, we thank uh, Marcel again for his talk. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is uh, 